into the vortex. Hello and welcome to Time Rotor Talks, uh, an all new podcast series. We've already done one episode ranking uh, series 1 to 14. Now we're going to start a full review of Shuti Gatwa's debut season for his 15th Doctor. And we're going to start by doing Space Babies and the Devil's Chord. So naturally we're going to start with episode 1, Space yeah, Babies. We should probably introduce us by saying you're Max and I'm Ben and we love Doctor Who. I think that's quite obvious though. <laughs> Yes, especially since you've just stated it. <laughs> that is such a Doctor Who fan thing to do, isn't it? I love Doctor Who, did you know? <laughs> All right, right, anyway. Yes. Space um, Babies. Oh, this is going to be fun, isn't it? I, uh, I think we should start by um, talking about the opening scene, because I, I think this, for me, is one of the highlights of the episode. It's just, yes, I agree. I think the first ten minutes is the best ten minutes of the episode. Yeah, absolutely. In my opinion, so... I think the way, I think every now and again, Doctor Who does need a slight sort of soft reboot, and obviously that happens a lot. And in 2005, 2010, 2017, 2018, and you know, I think with the new era, especially since it's kind of the first proper one on Disney yeah. Plus, um, not including Church and Ruby Road because we don't talk about that. I, I think it was good to sort of have the companion go in the TARDIS and be like, oh my god, it's bigger on the inside. And the Doctor's like, oh yeah, I'm the last of the Time Lords, I'm this and that. Um, and just showing off and yeah. stuff. Yeah, can I just, I, I want to say one thing. Although the intro is good, it is a bit exposition it, it did give me a little bit of criminal vibes in terms of she's just asking questions to further the plot. And it kind of makes sense, but I just wish it was done a little bit better in terms of like, think about rose or uh you know the pilot those two episodes really kind of just tell you everything without just having a yeah. companion ask the doctor a load of questions yeah. uh, so it's certainly not the best series opener for like a new viewer no. but it is a decent way to do it i, I do think it's a, a solid opener like the first 10 minutes gets you into it i was quite enjoying it when i was watching it live yeah. re-watching it obviously as a viewer who's seen the show for years it's a bit boring but it's still quite good i'll grant you that i thought that some of the sort of some of the script in the opening is a bit weak like there's a bit where ruby's about to go outside and um the, the whole thing about like stepping on a butterfly um and the doctor's like oh come here butterfly like i i kind of cringed a little bit <laughs> but um yeah i did cringe a bit of that like i don't mind millie gibson's acting but it's 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 kind of i don't really know how to describe it there's sort of a She's very animated. God, do you know how? Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I think in the first episode she's very different to all the others, and I think that's maybe an issue with them filming them out of order. Is she went from doing seventy-three yards first from being, you know, the lead role. She had to be a really confident and outgoing character to then go and do the first episode where you're kind of like introducing yourself again must be a little bit weird yeah because it's suddenly like oh okay i've got to be a bit naive now and i think maybe like you said it was a bit overdone in some ways that's not all her fault i don't think it really is her fault but yeah i, I get what you mean i think she is i think this is her weakest episode yeah yeah i do think filming out of order really does impact a lot um unless you've got like oscar winning actors who just can pull it like, i'm not saying they're not you know worthy of an oscar but yeah you know, I feel like someone like Peter Capaldi could just be like, oh yeah, I can pull this off. <laughs> well, not everyone's Peter Capaldi. <laughs> exactly. I think it was, they are really good actors. Um, and I think, obviously, I know we're not talking about the whole series, but that is a thing um, that I'd like to bring up because we didn't bring it up when we were talking about it before. This series does do justice to Shooty and Millie for how good they are at what they do. Yeah. Because they have some really incredible stuff. But yeah, uh, Space Babies is... Let's get back on track before we waffle. Space Babies is quite a flawed episode. Um, yeah, I mean... I think the general plot is just a bit <sighs> meh for an opener of a series. I, I can't lie. I did enjoy it more when I rewatched it. It was... Um, even though yeah, I sort I of that. knew what was going to happen, more but first... when you watch it the first time, yeah, it's... <laughs> you're expecting a lot. Well, no, you, you just don't know what to expect. Like, you know, it... Well, that's true. But, like, the hype, you know, it was all hyped up, and then you get to that. And I thought it was going to be more of, like, a 
less comedy, more mystery episode from like the promo stuff we had from it with like, you know, the monster they're running away. And it ended up just being like kind of cheesy comedy. And that's just not really my episode. Well, I say that I enjoyed an episode like New Earth, which in some sense is similar to this. But for some reason, the, the comedy in that is really good. Whereas in this episode, it just felt like I was cringing a lot. To be honest, I think that it does set the tone for the series though i'm not saying the entire series is like space babies yeah that is it's true. not but it shows you know the dynamic between the doctor the quirky and the side the fact that there's a more yeah. comedic tone to this series and it's more cheeky in its scripts and things like that um yeah so i don't necessarily think that's a bad thing um no that is true i, I think you're never gonna get a perfect series opener like even something like the eleventh hour isn't perfect. Yeah. Um, I mean, look at the lens flares that they just wax on every time. Yeah, I know. I, was, but, I always wondered um, what they were as a kid. <laughs> I was just sat on the sofa being like, "Why is there a blue <laughs> light there?" They were. Just... <laughs> yeah, that was bad. But I think, um, I think just the plot for me wasn't bad. It wasn't uh, like there wasn't tons of plot holes. It was more just the fact that I. I lacked an interest into it purely just because it's like it's I don't want to use the word silly but I can't really think of a better word other than it is just, and I know Doctor Who is always like that I mean look at Cassandra but like this one felt a little bit far-fetched and I think the the, the CGI on the baby's mouth because it was inconsistent it actually yeah, distracted me yeah. if it was just if it was consistently bad that would have been better than being consistently or like inconsistent in terms of being good and then bad suddenly. Yeah, because there'll be one line where it's like, oh, that's fine. And the next is like, well, he didn't say that. <laughs> yeah, this moves us on to our next point, which is after the sort of opening scene, then the Doctor and Ruby end up landing on um, the space station. And yes, they come across the babies and things like that. And I can't lie, when the first baby appeared, I did think, um, <laughs> okay, where are we going with this? And the, the CGI yeah. on the mouth is, it's not good. And I I watched I watched no, the Doctor is, Unleashed thing on it, it and they actually did like CGI models of the baby's faces and stuff and got them to move. Yeah, how did it go so badly for some of yeah, them? Yeah, like no offense to the VFX artists, but it just didn't look like they'd done that at all. I think they were there for too long. I think that was my when I was watching it and then when I resaw it a few weeks ago, I was like, they're just here for too long. I want to see this is more about the Doctor and Ruby getting their dynamic on. I know that was a bit like the Church and Ruby Road as well, but. I just wish we saw more of them and less of the babies. What about um? I don't know. What, what about the sort of introduction of um, the snow when the Doctor suddenly has the flashback? That scene was good. To be fair, that scene was. I I was very in. I was very intrigued when I saw that. For it the was first very time. well oh, shot. The Saturday. the jump cuts with Shizzy yeah. in the same position. Oh um, yeah, that was. Per I mean, the directing yeah. was fine. Like, there's nothing wrong with the directing of any of the episodes. Um, it's yeah. I think that's the issue with this episode is the highs are high and the lows are low so it's like it's hard to it's like overall it's just a mid episode what do you think of the nanny character i thought she was rather good actually she was good i feel like she could have maybe done a bit more just a little bit like i feel like again we saw more of the babies than her and i'm like why like she's a good actress good character i I just I think if we had ten minutes or five minutes less with the babies and five minutes more with the other three adults, <laughs> not yeah, to put them down. But I think it would have benefited the episode. I think this sort of brings it on to the main complaint of this episode that the pacing is a bit all over the place. And um, oh yeah, the pacing is pretty brackney. Uh, oh, I can't speak. Neck break. Yeah, I mean it's yeah. partly impacted by the fact that the opening scene is so sort of different in terms of its just general speed to everything else but I think that's yeah. partly because yeah. of the fact that there was a scene in the TARDIS where you know when uh, the Doctor gets out his his sonic screwdriver and he presses the button and then the TARDIS takes off yeah he keeps saying push the button throughout yeah. the episode I swear yeah there counts, was a there was a scene where he takes the sonic out and he sonics the jukebox and it starts playing push the button there's a song called that apparently <laughs> oh okay and um that's the issue with doing something, cutting something like that. It just means all those lines are a bit Yeah, weird. the thing is, it doesn't... It's quite an integral part of the episode, the whole push the button thing, which is something I, I noticed when I was re-watching it with the knowledge that they had cut a scene. Yeah, especially at the end. Because when... Um, we'll get to the ending, of course, but when he's saving 
the bogeyman and he says push the button like i love that scene so much but the fact that he says that and the actual origin of that uh, line has been cut. <laughs> yeah, why did they cut it just, that? Why? It it's... doesn't make sense, and I don't know why they would have cut something like that. Again, yeah, I feel like I said this lot in the first episode, uh, in our last podcast episode, about the timing. I don't know if I said that on there or if I was just saying it to you mm. in real life, but I feel like they're pressured by having a 45-minute runtime, so they cut stuff like that, and it really is detrimental to the actual episode. Not yeah, majorly, but like for people like us who are trying to review it it's like well he keeps saying this one line and the reference has been cut so it's like it's it's just yes yeah, yes yeah, weird yeah i i just um it's just a shame really because you'd think if it's the first episode of the season they could get away with a bit of a longer runtime but then of course on disney plus it's not the first episode of the season the first episode of the season is yeah i think again s- yeah yeah similarly to that point i think the christmas special should have been more of an introduction to the dynamic between Ruby and the Doctor rather than this episode doing that because I feel like we just had two episodes doing the same thing Mm. so like the first episode was obviously getting the Doctor to meet Ruby and then being introduced right but then I feel like this episode I know it was like her first adventure into you know space like you know you have stuff like the end of the world or the Shakespeare code you know or uh, what was Donna's first one? The Fires of Pompeii. Yeah. Stuff like that. It's their first adventure. Yet this one just still felt like it was the first time they've just met. If you know, I, I, I saw. I do know what you mean. I really think that. I think the Church and Ruby Road and Space Babies were almost too similar in some sense. Yeah. So that it feels like we just had two episodes where, with the exact same tone, with the you know exact same sort of like themes of okay the doctor and ruby are meeting and getting together and knowing each other i also just feel like ruby had nothing to do in space babies or very little to do compared really to, I, 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 to, I i disagree like, well, i kind of want to compare I, I think it. that she was given well, some what, do, what does she do in the plot though i can't even like what does she actually the fact do? is that she's she trying to comfort the, the babies and then she says the bogeyman isn't real which is why eric goes downstairs and that moves the plot along so technically ruby is a no yeah that is device. true but i just i think when i look at the end of the world which is series one episode two from 2005 it's not a perfect episode but rose rose's character in that episode is like perfectly integrated into the story because she, if you took her out the plot would be the same but that's because she's having her own mm. story she is just you know you're kind of seeing her character unfold and seeing her reactions to certain scenarios and in this episode, I feel like Ruby was just there. I think maybe like for the first... Like, she didn't have a ton of reactions to stuff. That was my main No, thing. she didn't. That's a good point, actually, because I know we keep going back to the opening scene, but when she... Um, when the Doctor says it travels in time and space, she just does the Millie Gibson thing and, and looks around with a very surprised face and doesn't really <laughs> say, say anything. That is quite an iconic look for her. Yeah, uh, at least... I mean, look, it's nowhere near as bad as... The Chibnall stuff. No, I mean, no. those three companions got told there's a bomb in their neck, and they were like, <laughs> "Oh, no, I don't remember." Um, but you know, but um, but I just, I, I think this is like she's got very good characterization, but she isn't using it enough to make you feel like she's developing in any sense. I've said this to you before. There isn't really any character development in the series. It's just characterization which is done well but it doesn't really but they travel like, the, anywhere yeah the, the, exactly the doctor and millie are the exact same from day one from episode one to episode eight you could say you know ruby got more confident blah blah, blah. well obviously because that's what happens to every companion they haven't had their own journey and i think that's something we'll probably see more of in the next year's series yeah but yeah i th- i think the ending is something that makes this episode like yeah uh, this like this is something that to... i wanted to address because um, the problem with the ending is that it's the way that they introduce the fact that the bogeyman gets saved is actually really well constructed. The fact that the doctor looks through the glass and, you know, we get flashbacks to the start of the episodes where he says, I'm the last of the Time Lords. And I just thought that was that was brilliant. Yeah. For me, that was Shooty's um, I am the doctor moment. That was when I, I thought, okay, th- this is this is the doctor. But the problem with it is that um, he saves the bogeyman, but like, what does the bogeyman do? Because they, because 
later on in the episode, he looks on the computer and the Bogeyman's just downstairs, like, howling. And... Yeah, he's just been in severe pain. His body's been ripped apart by the atmosphere of space. And they're just like, just send him to the to the planet. But lo- like, to, he- also, he just launches them at the planet. They have no engines, no brakes. What if they just go a little bit too far? I think... I they think gonna the, the planet is supposed. To, this is supposed to be in like the far future, so they would have some kind of thing. But again, that's a head <laughs> yeah. cannon. Why doesn't Russell put that in the script? <laughs> this is another common theme of our podcast yeah. episodes. Russell forgets to finish the plot properly. When we get to the dot and bubble one in a few weeks' okay. time, I will certainly be talking about yeah. that. <laughs> I think that it would have been better if the Doctor had. Um, um, actually done something with the Bogeyman, maybe like taking him in the TARDIS, just putting him on a world that he can actually live. That would have been cool. It would have been weird. But it yeah, it would have been cool. weird, but I think just having it downstairs when the ship's gonna, sorry, the, the space station's gonna be going down to the planet anyway, and the Bogeyman's gonna have to exactly. die. Exactly, it's one of those, th- yeah, I, mate, now you said that, it makes me think a little bit, it seems like Chibnall writing, where it's like, the morals are there, but they're not properly yeah. done because it's like okay the doctor saved him but now what he could just go for all he knows the bogeyman's going to get tested in a lab and torn apart like yeah I do, it's, it's just a, little a bit, bit um, strange weird. and i don't think russell thought that one through as much as he thought should have done though yeah but i do like space babies i even though it's a bit strange in terms of its plot um it is one of the most flawed of the series and it probably is the it probably, if you had to say, I, I hate using the word worst, but it probably is the worst one of the series. I don't know. Okay, so where do we think we'll put Space Babies then? Are we only having five categories? I don't think okay. anything's is anything in the series is bad enough to be in E or F. That's true. Well, I think... <laughs> The thing is, if we don't put this in D, what is actually going to go there? I know, obviously, we're not going to state that now because that's kind of the point of this yeah. podcast series. But I feel like for me, this would, out of all of them, this is the one that would go in D. It is definite. Oh, it's definitely floating. Because it's floating. <laughs> yeah, it's floating. But I think we're going to have to put one there. And let's be honest, it's probably going to be this one. Okay. <laughs> Max is like, no, no, it, it don't just, do it. It just hurts because I do actually like this episode, but compared yeah, to all the other terrible, ones, but but compared to the other ones, it's it's bad. So no, no, you're still holding on. Let go. Just chuck okay. it there, Max. Just okay. let go. <laughs> well, now we move on to the opposite for Max. It's his. It's his. Yes, favorite, my favorite right? episode of the series. So the Devil's Chord, episode two. Um, although we should probably talk about the structuring of this series when we talk about this episode, because obviously um, it's been six months for Ruby and the Doctor in this episode. Yeah, this is the f- so we've missed out on all of that character development. Yeah, this, this which is the most integral part. This is the one thing I absolutely hate about the Devil's Court because the rest of it, I'm sure you'll yeah. see that the rest of the Devil's Court I absolutely love. It is it's just brilliant, but. There's this one line where the doctor says that Ruby comes from um, June 2024. So when is it for you back home? What time are you? June 2024. Uh, it's hard to keep track, but yeah, I think so. June, July. When the church on Ruby Road is set in December 2023. Which means that Ruby has been on the TARDIS for how many months? And yeah, six, six months. months. And this is her second episode. And in Boom, yeah, so it directly we was, says yeah. that that's her first alien planet. Yeah, exactly. When me and Max were talking about this the other week, um, off line, uh, that sounds weird, but you know what I mean? Not on a podcast episode. Um, we s- clearly stated that this is just wrong. Like, the fact that she's been on in the TARDIS for six months and she hasn't been on an alien planet just makes no yeah. sense because any human being, even if you're scared of space, would be like, okay, it's been six months, let's go to an alien planet. 
for all we know, Boom could be five months after the next one. Like, you know, it just... Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I think the Devil's Chord should have been placed in a different position, nearer to the end. Episode five or six would have been ideal. But that doesn't mean the episode itself is Yeah, I mean, if we, the if we look past plot that one line that kind of ruins yes. the structure of the series... <laughs> Yeah, if it if that if that if that month was just like swapped out for January, this episode would be a lot better. But yeah. Yeah, but looking past that, I think addressing the opening scene of the episode where the Doctor and Ruby are. Oh wait, no, it starts with Maestro on the piano, doesn't it? Um, yeah, that okay. I must admit that that's opening a brilliant opening. Minute, absolutely even, excellent. Even before my yeah, I, even before Maestro gets there, that like the cinematography was incredible. But mainly just like the actual, like the general sort of feel was perfect. I, like that's my favourite opening to the any episode of the whole series. Yeah, it is brilliant. I think this episode is certainly one of my favourites from the series, purely just because there aren't that many, there aren't any plot holes really. There's a few issues I have of it, like all of them, because there isn't a 10 out of 10 episode in this series in my opinion, but No, I agree. I think especially going from Space Babies to this one, it's clear this is very, very solid. Yeah. Um, I think my favourite part is probably the cinematography. It is. Um, the like directing the, all those, is All those shots in the TARDIS. Brilliant. Absolutely flawless. Yeah, especially when they change into their outfit and it like goes up, down and tilts, and the one where she's just about to step outside to see London 2024 has been completely, you know, burnt to the ground yeah. and stuff. And it's this massive, like, it's this really long shot and it slowly pushes in. All that stuff is perfect. Obviously, that doesn't make the episode great. but No, but but the um, opening scene of the episode, um, I know we've already talked about the, the pre-title sequence, but the post-title sequence scene where the Doctor and Ruby are in the TARDIS and Ruby's like, can we go and see the Beatles? And then they just have fun, they change their costume... And it's the first time in Doctor Who I think we've seen a companion and the Doctor sort of, well, since Ten and Rose, really, sort of actually having fun and actually travelling in time the way that, you know, yeah. if you had a TARDIS, the way you and your mate would travel well, I'd around. Say since, like, do you know what I mean? It's I'd, Yeah, yeah. I'd say since Ted and Donna. Yeah, okay. Because the, the unicorn and the wasp is literally them having fun. So, like, Fair. but, yeah, I, I, I agree. I'm not saying that we didn't see that of Matt or, you know, Karen Gillan uh, as Eleven and Amy. But, it, yeah, in this episode, it really feels like two really close mates having fun, which is good. But the sad thing is that we've skipped that six months of character development, yeah. and I want to see them get closer. Similarly to how, um, you know, Martha gets closer with the Doctor, and obviously Ten gets closer with... Rose. I feel like something it's just that they, they did miss an opportunity with that, because when you have... A character arc as big as Ruby's with her mother and stuff um, and the mystery yes. surrounding that you really have an opportunity to build character around that like the Doctor and Ruby could have become yeah. closer by simply discussing that and the Doctor because the point of the Doctor and Ruby's characters is that the Doctor was adopted by Tech Taeun, yeah, and Ruby was adopted by um, Carla and they are sort of general opposites or, or really they're the same and that's something that they really could have bonded over and it's only referenced yeah, a few times yeah I wish times. we saw more of that yeah it, it just should have been yeah, touched upon it's... more because I think it was quite a missed opportunity but in terms of the episode I think that yeah. the whole thing with the Doctor and the Companion having fun is something that the Chip and Lyra missed out on because they just said they were having fun and we never actually saw that element of running <laughs> around no the TARDIS in, in 60s costumes, going to see the Beatles because they can. Like, that's what I love about the opening of The Devil's Chord. It is just... I, I can't think of any other word yes, than realistic, great. really. Yeah, it creates a nice sense of realism in terms of characterization. Mm -hmm. Once again, good characterization in this series. Yeah. I like the... I like all. I like the first twenty-five minutes, especially. I think it just—it's good pacing. You kind of see them go into the Beatles. It's exciting. They start playing bad songs, and that's the same for every you know artist there and the bands and stuff as well. It's all terrible music. So, um, I think it's a really, really good like first act, especially the. 
piano scene from Ruby. I think it just fit. Well. Yeah, it, it sort of was a nice little sort sort of like just the episode just stops and lets you think and lets you listen to the music and it yeah it's something we just never gives have, you a little bit of a break really and well. Doctor Who for such a fast paced series as it always has been yeah I think it's something that does work really well and I'd love to yeah, see more it works of that really well in the future yeah exactly because they have to cram in so much in 45 minutes yeah. and it kind of having that just it was it was quite a long time as well it was like two three minutes it was a nice amount of time to just sit there and be like this is great and also to appreciate Murray Gold we all love Murray yeah, Gold the goat but yeah um, I think I feel like people's main issue with this is I either Maestro when I say Maestro I mean um, Jinx Monsoon's performance because I see a lot of people say it's a little bit inconsistent I can kind of get where they're coming from but I don't think it's I don't think it's anywhere near as bad as people are saying online like I think it's it's pretty good Maestro um, as like the acting I'm gonna say something that will probably get loads of people to unsubscribe or something but <laughs> I think that Maestro is has been like I think she is one of my favourite Doctor Who villains of all time and I mean that I think that Jinx Monsoon's performance yeah, is just I think... it's so over the top and that is the point she's yeah, it's the child the of the toy, toy maker, maker the fact that you know? is... and yeah. there's I think there's multiple points where um and she says, "Oh, Daddy, treat me badly," or, or something like that. And it's it's such a small part of the thing, but it, the idea that the toy maker sort of mistreated them, and then they've become this, they've become the stealer of music, and all of that idea about um, music being a physical thing that impacts people. I think that's a really good idea, and to build a villain yeah. around that while using yeah, an existing yeah. no, art with the toy yeah. maker. Um, I just think it's really well constructed and I think it's one of Russell's yeah, it's best it's really work. good. Yeah, and the scene in which there's the massive, like, um, projection on the wall and they're in the, you know, the blank room and she's laying on the piano. It's, it's just, like, phenomenally... It's, like, phenomenal in terms of aesthetics, but it's also just really well written, like, everything. Yeah. But I think that's the point when Ruby becomes a little bit sidelined and she's just kind of there again like she had her it's almost like she had her 25 minutes and then in the end she's just kind of there and I think again if you're going to write a character you've got to have them do something in every single second I was re-watching The Impossible Planet and The Satan Pit just a week ago um, before we recorded the previous podcast actually and um, Rose is always doing something she's always there being a character being her Mm. character and I think it's just something that Russell's again focusing on the plot and the character, the companion's getting a little bit sidelined. Not majorly, but no, I, I, I agree. To talk there's about. there's a point where um, they're being shown the montage of nuclear war by Maestro, and yeah. Ruby is like, she does the normal. She has no lines, I swear. Her one line is like, "Why would you do this? Um, you know, you've killed all these yeah, people and it's for very, what? Yeah. And like, you know, you would say that, but it it does kind of give away that the companion doesn't actually have that yeah, much. Yeah, that's to do. the thing. Exactly, and it's like, this is six months, so she should be brave now. I would have loved for her to go and stood up and comforted the Doctor, a bit like Mel did in Empire of Death. Something like that would have been great, which is then why this episode should have been positioned later on in the series. I wouldn't even um, care if so it was like episode sort of three. As long as Boom second and the series is fine. But it, that a six-month yes. thing, it's just... It's such a small thing, but has such a massive impact on the characters. It does have a big impact, yeah. Um... And I, I think I don't want to say I don't want to say the Doctor is bad in this, but I do feel like it's not his strongest episode in terms of like yeah he has the big showdown at the end and stuff, but I also just do feel like he's almost kind of running around and not doing a lot as well. I feel like it's just kind of it's very very focused on the villain and the plot, and the characters are a little bit sidelined. I don't know if you. Can I do get, get what you mean. I, he does. He does run around like a mad thing. Even in a yeah, bit even in shooting. yeah, even in Rogue, he has more to yeah. do, and it's like that's a pretty simple plot, and yet he has a lot to do, and it's just trying to get that balance was a little bit hard in this series, I think. Yeah, <laughs> something I really did enjoy though, and is to do with the characters, is when the Doctor realizes that you know he heard the giggle, and he's like, I can't fight this yeah. thing, and then Ruby's like, Well, 
hang on, I, I'm still here, music didn't go away. Yeah, all of that and stuff is perfect. that comes from the, the, the only classic story which you've watched, Pyramids of Mars. Um, that's the only yes. other time that's happened where the Commandion's gone, hang on, I didn't die, so there's nothing that can happen here, we might as well just fly away. And the fact that that's yeah. done again, but modernised in such a brilliant way, where, where yeah, they come good. out of the TARDIS to see London in a nuclear war, and the Doctor's like, I think people go to a war yeah. and they don't even know why. And then Ruby's like, where's my mum? Like, that was really dark. Like, I was taken aback by that when I yeah. first watched it. That was incredible. That was really, really good. But that leads me on to my main negative of this episode is the ending because we get at least three minutes or so of the what's it called the musical mm. the the dance and singing number and i don't mind it but i think it should have stopped when it started raining indoors and it's stuff like that where it's like okay but i just it's not it's it just doesn't fit like if the first minute of that musical worked because everyone's it makes sense in terms of the plot as well Maestro has been defeated so there's a ton of music in the air and all that and like when they walk across the abbey road it becomes like a keyboard that's cool but i really wish we saw a scene i've said this to you before where we see ruby go back to or go forward again to 2024 and carla's fine and she runs up to carla she hugs her and carla's like what's wrong you know i only saw you a few weeks ago and then ruby's like oh no nothing because we've seen that happen before I'm yeah sure that happened with rose and you know like that. And i think it's something we missed out no on. i agree you know that flashback in rogue where the doctor says to carla i will keep her safe yes that scene could have happened at the end of the devil's court along with your suggestion exactly and i feel yeah. like that would yeah, have worked both, a lot better yeah, both of those combined <laughs> Yeah, both of those combined. And all of the character issues in the Devil's Court, and admittedly there aren't that many, but the thing with Ruby not having much to do, that would have been completely solved if that little thing exactly, was Exactly, because again, you're going to see Ruby's journey, because again, we see the world of, you know, the Doctor's life through the Companion's mm. eyes. But then in this episode... I almost feel like we were watching it from the Doctor's point of view, which made me feel not as connected because every episode we're always like seeing it through the companion's eyes because they know as much as we do, nothing basically. Um, and I think that's something that felt, it just felt different. And I don't think it was bad, but I think again, Ruby was sidelined too much um, in the like the final act. And again, we've got the stuff with the, the music, right? She's got a hidden song inside of her. This isn't this episode's fault particularly, but the ending didn't really wrap that up as well as it could no, have No, no, it didn't. So, and it was a really cool thing to have. I love that scene where she's floating. It looks sick and it is written. Yeah, and the fact that it the way really the Doctor results. reacts to that and when she starts singing and Maestro is just confused, I did kind of think, you know, what what's happening here? Not as a negative, but I was genuinely sort of concerned that like something big was going to happen. Like obviously Ruby wasn't going to die, but you know things weren't looking good, and I really felt that sense of peril in that point of the episode because Maestro's basically won by that point. Like yeah. you know, they there's nothing the Doctor and Ruby can really realistically do, and in the end they don't, yeah, and it's the Beatles. Like which is quite funny, really, but, yeah, I, you know. I guess that brings us on to that bit, which is kind of the final bit to talk about, I guess, is the resolution of the, of the plot. Is like, the Beatles, they kind of don't really have a lot to do, and yet they solve mm. it, and I guess that's like a metaphor for how good they are, which I appreciate, I love the Beatles, but I just wish we saw them once more between their talk to Ruby and the Doctor and to the end, just once in the middle, um, and that would have been like, it would have felt like they were there a bit more. Yeah. Because it felt like they were like, oh, let's just bring them back from earlier. Yeah. <laughs> from like right at the beginning. I, I do know what you mean. It did feel a little bit sort of... Yeah, this episode, if this episode was 55 minutes, it would be a 10 out of 10. I agree. I, I do think it's a 9 out of 10 episode. And, you know, it, I, it it's is really brilliant. Good. But there are a few things that could have been done There are better. some issues that mean a lot. That's the, that's, the, that's the main issue with the issues is it's it's these tiny things that actually you know mean so much in terms of the story and the series. it's quite funny really that we're it's talking annoying. about all these negatives and then i'm saying like it's a nine out of ten episode <laughs> yeah we're just trying to we're trying to highlight and pick out the bad stuff to talk yeah. about because there is a lot of good um in terms of the tier list i think we I think we've probably spoken enough about this episode 
I think it's certainly a good one. It's definitely going above B, yeah. but it's whether it goes in S. I, I, I guess if we're going to put one in S, it's going to probably be this one and maybe one other or two others. We'll see how we go. Um, I think... But I would happily put this in A or S. I don't the really fact know. that I... Again, this like, is... When I went into this episode, I was expecting to hate it. I'm not going to lie. From all the promotional stuff, I thought I'd hate this episode. Yeah, I get that. But it's my favourite of the series. Yeah. And I feel like I'd and be I doing think, it yeah, a disservice to in put regard- it in a. Yeah, and this is, this is an S to D tier list from this series. This isn't like of all episodes. So for this series, an S tier episode is probably this one. And this is going to be quite controversial because... Some I feel like the fan base is split. Half the people love this episode and half people don't really yeah, like it. Yeah, I agree. So it's going to be interesting to see people's kind of thoughts. But I think if you don't like it and you ask and I ask you why, it's probably going to be something to do with Jinx Monsoon's character. And realistically, that's just nonsense because yeah. <laughs> the character's exactly. fine. It's just the toy maker as a, as a as a female representation of the toy maker, basically. So mm. just yeah, I think it's fine. I think it's a great episode. I think that's quite an interesting start. We've gone from the worst to the yeah, best. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was quite funny, really. But yeah. One at the bottom, one at the top. Exactly. But yeah, we'll be doing uh, Boom and 73 Yards, which is, I think, a really, it's going to be a really interesting Oh yeah, that's going to be one. interesting. Because we have similar opinions, but I think, I'm trying not to be biased, but I love horror mysteries, so I quite like 73 Yards. Yeah. So we'll see. Well, you have to wait and see for that one to come out. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks for watching this video. Um, and thank you, yeah, guys. Make sure to join us for the next review with 73 yards and boom. Thanks for watching. And a three, two, one. I've got a dog, he's called Fred. My dog is alive, he's not dead. I love my dog, he loves me too. I have.